Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sunkara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. Before we start, I'd like to apologize for my voice as I'm recovering from a bad flu. In this episode of Lab to Startup, we will talk to Marcus Lehman, the co-founder and CEO of CalWave Energy. CalWave is unlocking the power of the ocean by harvesting the dense energy packed in waves, which is about 30 to 60 times more dense than solar or wind. We will talk about the underlying technology development, engineering challenges, partnerships that help them learn faster, and how they are currently testing their product under the water near San Diego, California. One of the biggest surprises for me and the team is how reliable the product has been since it was installed underwater last September. This speaks for the meticulous planning and engineering prowess of the team from the design phase of the product development. I've known Marcus from our days together at UC Berkeley, and the progress that their lean team has been making over the years is super impressive. I really hope you enjoy my conversation with Marcus. Welcome to the show, Marcus. It'll be most helpful if you can paint a thumbnail sketch of the problem you're solving at CalWave Energy and a brief description of the solution so we can align the audience before jumping to the details. Yeah, thank you for the question. In general, our vision at CalWave is to unlock the power of ocean waves to secure a clean energy future. And we're trying to accomplish that through our mission by providing reliable and cost-effective ocean wave technology for sustainable energy access. Overall, we're driven by the big challenge of climate change that we're facing as a society, as well as our generation of engineers to find solutions. And here, wave energy is the largest unused renewable resource that has really great features. We can produce power at night and winter times, and that is really a growing problem that is needed to be addressed to help us to transition to 100% renewables and really decarbonize the electric grid, which is still the largest contributors to global greenhouse gas emissions. I don't think most of us have a sense of the energy hidden in ocean waves. Can you paint a picture for us? I think the most visual is probably if you've ever been surfing and picked up by a wave and just thrown around like nothing. So that gives you a sense on the energy density. Overall, we're saying wave power has about 30 to 60 times the energy density compared to wind and solar. It's really just water moving. So the density of water just comes with so much more energy concentration. So rule of thumb for the U.S. coastlines is that about a meter of coastline has about 30 to 60 kilowatts on average. So solar, for example, a square meter is about one kilowatt on a very sunny day without clouds. A meter of coastline equivalent would have 30 to 60 times the energy density. So the amount of space we need to get to the same amount of installed power is exactly that factor smaller. That is fascinating, 30 to 40 times. Why hasn't this caught up? I don't hear too many people talking about ocean waves and energy, and we talk so much about wind and solar. What happened there? What was missing? And how did you get here? People have been investigating that resource for a while. It's been a first generation of developers looking to commercialize wave energy in the 70s with the first oil crisis, where we really urgently were looking for new solutions. I hear a lot of voices saying we should have just continued investigating all these solutions without any pauses, but it seemed like it's been very cyclical depending on the overall energy market and driven by the oil crisis or other crises often. The main reason why wave energy is slightly behind in terms of commercial application compared to wind and solar it's really that one, we didn't have a scalable solution there, a technology, 
And the main reason for that is one, the simulation tools were too expensive, as well as the testing and validation of these systems is just more complex. Wind and solar, you can test in your backyard. The very first end users were farmers. For solar, it was NASA actually for outer space. For WAVE, there are some niche applications in the blue economy where we really need power offshore, but on a utility scale, it's really to test these novel devices, it has to be done right. And that takes a minimum amount of capital. The combination of that minimum amount of capital, the right architecture, and then the right preparation and simulation tools, all these three things we're seeing now are coming together. And that's why we think it's really on the brink of becoming mainstream in the coming years. Let's go down that thread. Let's talk about each of these things, technology, which is the core of your startup. Can you help us understand the technology behind your startup that made this possible, transforming this wave energy into electricity? What was that breakthrough that helped you form the company? The solution we're currently offering to the market is really the result of several years of iterations and learnings. Our company went through the US Wave Energy Prize, which was a two-year-long competition with four gates and four rapid cycles of iteration on that technology. And to give you an idea how it works, it's really as close to an electric car that just sits underwater, and then it's moored to the ocean floor. And so, as you know, an electric car that goes downhill produces electricity by braking. So we're reducing the speed of the car, the kinematics, and that produces power, recharges the onboard batteries, the same power then can be used to accelerate the car. And so in our case, the system is really, as you might remember from your high school physics classes, it's a mass damper model that just sits on a pendulum and it just swings. So we've designed it in a way that it swings as much as possible, driven by the waves. And then similar to an electric car, we take out that energy and produce it into usable electricity. So this is the main functionality, similar to a wind turbine, produce electricity as efficient as you can. The second main functionality from a pure systems engineering point of view for a wind turbine is make it as cheap as possible. So that means the capex and the opex in the installation. That's really what we've designed for many years now is to reduce the costs while maintaining this really high performance. And both of these really have to be in balance. It's often called techno-economics. What you want to avoid is to build a Formula One car that has amazing performance, but no one can afford it. And especially for renewable energy, cost is really the second equal important driver that leads to your product being dollar per kilowatt hour. Um, both of these have an equal ranking in your set of systems requirements from our point of view. And that's really also how we arrived at that cheap of wind power today is that wind power next to the most efficient design it has found ways to mitigate storm loads that's being accomplished through pitch and yaw control. So the ability of the turbine to actually be shut down or automatically reduce the storm loads. And that's really the critical feature that our technology is capable of. One, we want to interact with the wave as much as possible. But then sometimes when we have storms or these very extreme events, we want the system to be invisible in storms. So that's the contradictory demand on the actual structure itself interacting with the wave. So we have found very effective and unique features to accomplish that. There's so many questions I want to go after. Let's start with the last one. Why would you want to shut down during storms? Because the storms, they happen very infrequent. So just once a year or an offshore wind turbine or oil platform, they have to be designed for the 50-year storm. That means the biggest storm that happens every 50 years. So if you look at the total revenue potential of a wave site, and then you see how much power could actually be generated from these storms. It's a tiny fraction. It's like below 0.01% because they only happen very infrequent. So it's a very rare events with a lot of energy. So it doesn't make sense to design for them because to be able to handle these loads, you would need something that's thousand times stronger and more expensive. But then they happen so infrequent that they don't really contribute to a lot of energy production. So wind does exactly the same. Rule of thumb is that once the wind speed gets higher than 15 meters per second, the wind turbine shuts off because that only happens just a couple of minutes per year. So there's not a lot of revenue potential in there. 
but it just drives up your costs um, unnecessarily. And you mentioned make them invisible. What do you mean by invisible? Just shut them down? That's exactly the challenge that if you're up on the surface and exposed to the actual surface waves, there's no way for you to actually hide or shelter. Our unique approach is that the system operates fully submerged. So we're sitting underwater at all times. And you were asking, what was that initial spark? And that was really more coming from geomimicry. A lot of people know about biomimicry. The flight of the bird has inspired Da Vinci to design the first mechanical airplanes and so on. Geomimicry is that you take phenomena from nature, from physics, and then that inspires design. And so in our case, a professor at MIT, then UC Berkeley, Professor Alam, investigated a certain mud floor that sits on the ocean floor, and that vibration is very effective in absorbing wave energy. And that was really, that was the initial spark that was driving our thinking of not being on the surface, but sitting submerged. And then based on that initial principle, we've done a lot of iterations in the wave tank initially, then also numerically and during the wave energy price. And then given all these complex requirements from cost to performance, to installability, maintainability, permittability, so it has to be easy to be permitted. So all these secondary requirements then really led to the optimized holistic solution we now have arrived at and demonstrating now in the field. So our first open ocean pilot currently, as we speak, is out in the water off the coast in San Diego and sending power back to shore. We mentioned about MIT and UC Berkeley. I see that the initial patents were filed through these two universities. Can you talk about the research that went on at these two places? How long has that been going on and how much research funding went into this and what exactly was being researched? So the very first investigation was Professor Alam's PhD thesis at MIT. And the goal here was to find a mathematical model to describe that mud vibration, because that's a phenomena that was not possible to be described mathematically initially. And really his expertise was in fluid dynamics and high order numerics. So he developed novel tools, high order spectral methods to mathematically describe that phenomena. And then I really came in back in 2012 and had a mixed background in systems engineering with energy systems, but also with product development, and then really took that initial mathematical model and built a first proof of concept in the wave tank. So I think that mixture of different domains really led then to a really constructive progress on the technology, and that led to the first patents that UC Berkeley filed. Professor Alam, his PhD was funded by NSF, potentially also ABS, and then later on by UC Berkeley, every assistant professor, they have an initial seed funding that allowed them to do research. I came back, continued to work on the system under a PhD, and that was funded by, I did a crowdfunding campaign in the very beginning. But then Cyclotron Road and Activates, and now at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, that was really the critical funding that allowed us to progress commercially then. Let's go back to one of the points you mentioned earlier about simulations. What advances were made in a period of doing this research? I don't know how long the research was going on for. Talk us through the advancement in simulations that help you give the confidence that you can transform something from the simulation to a real-world product. That simulation is really the heart of our IP and technology we've developed at CalWave and our CTO, Thomas Berner, has been really the leading and driving force behind that. So in fluid dynamics, there are different models. You can have a frequency domain or a time domain. The main difference is time domain is really just like a movie where you roll and you can go second by second versus frequency domain is a little more mathematical. When we entered the wave energy price, they initially required both a frequency domain model and a time domain model. And then Thomas really picked up a novel tool that the national labs have developed, Sandia and Enril in collaboration called Wexim. It's a wave energy converter simulation tool. And that's a toolbox based on a MATLAB platform. So we picked that up to meet the requirements of the wave energy price. And since then, we've modified it and customized it to our own purposes. So we use commercial tools to get the hydrodynamic coefficients from a boundary element method, as called. And then we feed this into this time domain model. And then this time domain model is really 
a dynamic simulation. Let's say you want to simulate a car running over a street and simulate the vibrations. You could do that in Simulink in MATLAB. So now that has a hydrodynamic aspect of it and the kinematic dynamic aspect of it, and that is being coupled. So that's a really powerful tool that is really the heart of all our design requirements from forces to power. And then what's normally being done in hydrodynamics that you build scaled models, and then you go and validate these. In Berkeley, we had a wave tank in the beginning, and then during the wave energy price, that was a critical requirement to validate our model initially in a 1 to 50 scale. And we went to the tank in Iowa. And then in the final round, the best 10 companies were invited to test in the largest wave energy tank in the US in Cataract, operated by the Navy. So we got seed funding there to build a 1 to 20 scale unit. So with every round of tank testing there, we could validate our model and build up more confidence in the accuracy and reliability of the model. I want to make sure the audience appreciates how much research actually went in at these universities and national labs that is like core to building a product like this. Moving along, what were the discussions around the initial drawing board look like in terms of product development? How long did you spend at the board before you started building anything concrete? We started off with that shallow water technology that had a flexible membrane based on that initial concept. And that was then really intended to be deployed in shallow water, so close to shore, similar to a piled offshore wind turbine. And then during the wave energy price, they had the requirement to have a system that can actually float in deep water. So the requirements were 120 meter water depth. So that wasn't suitable then in the beginning. Once we realized that and really investigated the wavelengths that are happening in that deep of a water, then we realized yeah, we have to fundamentally change our approach and that flexible membrane would have just gotten too large. So with my background in systems engineering and product development, I already had kind of an intuition for can this be installed? Can this be maintained? Is that a compact unit that can become a product that we can install and replace and so on? Given these change of requirements, we've done really well. Then in the price, we took that initial approach and improved it to make it one compact unit. So really similar to a wind turbine, that is just one single concentrated unit that can be deployed and installed like an offshore wind turbine, for example, in deeper water. The main goal for the wave energy price was really to avoid the pitfall that the previous generations in wave energy have done to go too big too fast. NASA and DOE, they have that technology readiness level, meaning you have a concept and then there are nine stages. And then in level nine, you have your system in the warehouse, in the marketplace. So what they've seen is that people had good ideas in wave energy. It looked good in the laboratory. And then they built them too quickly, too big. And then they built multiple of them like farms. And then they try to make the very fundamental learnings on these very big and expensive machines. And the problem that they ran into from a pure R&D management perspective is that once you're at that scale, you cannot go back anymore to do fundamental design changes. You're locked in with your investors, with your utility partners, with your patents and IP and so on. Based on these learnings from what happened there in the second generation of wave developers in the 2000s, that's how they designed the rules for the wave energy price and intentionally forced us to don't scale up, but do a lot of techno-economic optimization. And they called it TPL, technology performance level. They said, hey, keep it on a low TRL as long as you can. And then once you have built up confidence in your TPL into the cost effectiveness, cost competitiveness, and meeting all these additional requirements, then go ahead and scale up. I started working on the first concept, 2012-13, then we entered the price in 14, and that was then the final round of testing was in 16. And then in 2017, we won our first large DOE award to actually build an ocean-going unit. And that then with COVID, we got severely delayed, but that we actually put together the entire unit and put it in the field that took till last year, took us intentionally quite some time before we just throw something out in the water and then it doesn't work or we find out the economics don't make sense. So this was really more of a validation for us and not a trial and error because you cannot do that in the ocean and that size of machines anymore. It was good that the wave energy prize gave you the 
directions in terms of the requirements that probably helped and that economic evaluation really helps i think a lot of startups miss this paint us a picture of what that initial design team was like who was contributing was there an internal team was there an external team how big was the team to help you build something of the scale by now i call us the initial team as the special forces as we grow because back then we were wearing multiple hats and we put in quite some nights and weekends at times and that really forged the team together so in the beginning i was research scholar with the TEF lab with Professor Alam and I had a couple of undergrads and there were other PhD students and we had master students that were also visiting. We tapped into these resources and see who is interested, who can help. And then through that pool of people working on it, somehow like a really core group came out and crystallized. And yeah, I said, really, Thomas wrote his master thesis with me when I started my PhD. And then he really stood out exceptionally in what he was able to accomplish within six months in terms of design and testing there. Based on that great result, one of his work, but then also of the technology, he also came back with a PhD. And that was right at the time when I got the first larger seed funding with Cyclotron Road. And I think that was really critical because that allowed us to actually bring in a larger team. So one, we got a fellowship that allowed me to hire one more full-time role. And that was Nigel from MIT as well. He just graduated from a master's and then just jumped right into this entrepreneurial endeavor to say, hey, I have one year to give it a try. And this is a fully funded fellowship. And then with the funding from Cycleton Road, we were able to hire one more initial team member, Brian Murray. The four of us then really collaborated. That was really one of the biggest enablers that Cycloton wrote it, that in a pure academic context, people actually don't want a lot of teamwork because they want to isolate your individual contribution to your thesis and give that a nice grade. And that doesn't really help a lot towards encouraging collaboration and shared effort. Versus with Cycloton Road, that didn't really matter. No one of us really cared towards a degree or who is the lead author of a paper and so on. We just wanted to get the best performing solution into the wave price. And the entire team got the credit as a joint entity. We still had the benefits of collaborating with TAFLAB, but we were also far away removed and independent enough to make our own decisions more towards a commercial unit. So that was really a powerful combination in the very beginning. Amazing what you guys did with that lead of a team. Very inspiring. Let's slightly shift gears into talking about the product itself. Can you give us a scale of the size of the product? As most of the audience might not be able to imagine what you folks built. Windmills are huge in size. What does your product look like? Let's start there. So in general, as I said, it's really like an electric car. Dynamic system on the road has four wheels and that gives a lot of stability you have found similar stability in a wave energy device being submerged. So currently we're planning to offer three product lines to the market. The X-Note, about four meters, uh, 16 feet in diameter, and that is rated at about 15 kilowatts. That's the unit we're currently operating in the field. Then one step up, and that's the next unit we're planning to offer to the market, the X-100. That is about 13 meters in diameter and 100 kilowatts. And then the next step up is a 20 meter unit, and that's then about 800 kilowatts. So what you can see here is that the power goes up exponential where the dimensions go up linear in these scales. And that's really just that in the ocean, the wavelengths best respond with the 20 meter size unit. So there's some niche applications and very specific applications where the X node and the X100 really stands out and is well suitable but then to go into utility scale farms and produce the cheapest cost of electricity, the 20 meter unit, the 800 kilowatt unit is really the best based on our current analysis. From that point on, we can scale similar to a wind turbine and by making it wider, that increases the power rating than a more linear. What is the largest you imagine you'll be building? No one knows at the moment. For wind, even the CTO from Siemens, Hendrik Stiestel, said not that long ago, we've reached the limit of what wind can achieve. And I think that was a six megawatt turbine. And now we're at 16. I just attended an offshore wind conference two weeks ago, and I heard they're already working on 20 megawatt turbines. So it's hard to tell how the technology evolves. And that was another reason why the cost of wind kept coming down. 
that with larger machines, you benefit from these economies of scale. So having more power, higher energy production with the same amount of foundations and cable and installation and so on. So in general, there is a trend we're seeing towards economies of scale. But then also, of course, you want to leverage the industrialization and economies of mass production. So both of these economical phenomena then help to bring the cost down. Is there anything else that is submerged in the water that you learn from when you're trying to build your product? I'm assuming you haven't built anything at this scale in your life. Were you scared building something of this size? Of course, we don't want to reinvent the wheel and arrive at the best and cheapest solution as quickly as possible. And yes, since 17, since we got the large award from the UE to build the ocean going unit, we really ramped up the ability to collaborate. So we had very productive collaborations with the Sandia National Labs through a small business voucher, but then also with NREL. We've done a lot of risk reviews, design reviews. We've worked with mooring experts from the oil and gas industry, with naval architects that usually build ships and structures that go out in the ocean. So I think there's a whole range of other technologies that have mastered to go out in the ocean and operate there from structural and mooring and safety perspective. So we've transferred as much as what has been done and learned there. And that usually comes back then also to design standards. So DNVGL was actually initially designed for safety of offshore oil and gas operations. And then a lot of these design standards have then been used for offshore wind design and now also being used for marine energy. And NREL has developed some of their own criteria in the marine energy risk framework and ABS, American Bureau of Shipping. And we recently started a closer collaboration with, they also have their standards for operating vessels offshore. So there's a lot of already existing body of knowledge that we can transfer and apply. You mentioned a couple of times about the market. There's always this discussion about technology evaluation and a market evaluation. How do you define your markets? Us really being a technology discovery in that sense, there wasn't a clear market pool that said, hey, this is what the market wants, and then we find the best solution product. We knew that there is increasing demand for renewable energy and power, but then exactly what is your product market fit for that specific size of unit? And that is then one level deeper that took quite some work. So that was also part of Cyclotoon Road, where they really helped us to navigate that area. We were part of the clean tech to market by the Haas Business School and went through several business plan competitions as well in ourselves. So that really helped. And we've been following what the NSF is also strongly recommending with the i to do a lot of custom discovery, where you go and test the market, you speak with end users without actually showing them a product and try to validate their pain point and make sure that your solution fits on what they need. So for the X node, we found there's a really strong market fit in the offshore IoT space. So our unit is really compact and lightweight. And here we can provide power and data as a service offshore. What we found is that to get higher energy power offshore is very difficult and expensive. So currently that's being done with diesel generators or other fuel cells, for example, that run out of fuel and you have to refuel them or batteries that run out or like micro wind and solar that often is pretty challenging to get to larger power ratings offshore in a smaller unit. Because of the energy density of waves, our X node really stands out that we can pretty quickly get to about one to five kilowatt continuous power where other renewable sources would struggle to get that amount of power with such a small unit. And then for the X100, the 100 kilowatt unit, we've intentionally designed it to fit well into microgrids, specifically for islands. And here often there are softer criteria the customer are looking for. In our case, the system operates fully submerged. That means we're not causing any visual impact. And they really highly value that because often these communities they live off tourism and the landscape they have. So wind and solar is often really hard to be installed due to the visual impact and noise and others. And so our system being fully submerged doesn't take up space and doesn't cause any visual impact in these regions. So we can be really close to an end user, pretty much right off the shorelines. And next to that being submerged, we can dive away from hurricanes and typhoons. So these are some of these softer features that emerged over time that the end user really values. 
And then for the X800 and utility scale, the main benefits there is that we can produce power where no one else can. So we can co-locate it with the offshore or offshore wind farm. So we can produce at nights and winter times, as well as then winter nights, where pretty much wind or solar would not be available. Let's go down that thread of what were your customer discovery meetings like? Who did you identify as customers for your interviews? We had a lot of mentors and advisors. They made sometimes informal recommendations, introductions. And then if you come as a startup, they automatically assume you're trying to sell them something often. So there's a little bit of being intentional about how you approach them and who's approaching them. And what we found to be quite interesting that the clean tech to market team, they presented them as a group of students from the Haas Business School and elsewhere. And people got an email from students, you know, Berkeley domain at Berkeley EDU. And then they're more open to just have an informal chat about the pain points they're solving and We've defined that pain point and we try to validate that in planned experiments, validating our hypotheses and so on. So having that by a somewhat neutral third party can actually be helpful. And there are firms out there that do that kind of work. You could hire and they do market research for you. But then, of course, as a startup, you're always cash strapped and you're actually going to invest into market research. Most likely, you're going to spend that on other more urgent things. So doing that on a leaner way is really beneficial. To get a product market fit is really hard, especially for deep techs. I ask the founders these questions because it's mostly a technology challenge at this point of your startup than market risk because people know that there's a need for renewable energy. Let's slightly shift gears in talking about the engineering challenges in building your product. Talk about the mechanical, electrical, and robustness to withstand seawater kind of problems and how do you transfer the electricity that is produced offshore onto the land, if you can talk about the challenges one at a time and how you overcame those, it'll be really helpful because most people don't understand. The first question we often get, hey, what about corrosion and biofouling? Interestingly, looking at the four or five years we worked on the pilot, that was never really a big issue. We had a naval architect and they just said, hey, use this anti-biofouling coating and this suffocating anode. This is proven technology from oil and gas and offshore wind. We knew that it is a challenge that you have to take care of, but that's as equal a challenge of welding the other steel correctly to standards and meeting the safety requirements for all other parts. So people, they think they have some intuitive sense on what is the biggest challenge, but in reality, then the biggest challenge from an engineering perspective was really, are we designing for the right requirements? Do our simulations scale well? And is the actual controller robust? And there's also transition between a controller for a prototype versus a controller for a wind turbine. And if you look at the downtime for wind turbines, one of the biggest drivers are some stupid software updates on the wrong controller or some outages. So it's really interesting. We've heard some horror stories from other developers that deployed a device and they had a Microsoft software update and then their entire controls got frozen. And that actually then ended up breaking something physically. I think what we really try to identify are the reduce the risks as much as we can. So what we've used there is a failure effect analysis for Mika. We've been working with NREL and BNBGL following their processes. And so fundamentally, our expertise is systems development, similar to someone that builds or designs a wind turbine. So that's a critical tool that helps you to really go through all your parts, your subsystems, components. And then it helps you to understand what happens if this fails, what happens if this fails, what happens if these two together fail, so that failure tree of combinations. Then next to the parts, you have all different kinds of phases of a system. You have your normal operations, but then you also have your faults. Something fails, what do you do? Or a storm comes, you go into shutdown or installation. So you have all these different phases, then they also combine. And then you can get depending on how complex the system is, you can get pretty much down a rabbit hole of combining things with component failure and phase failure. And what we're often seeing, aerospace industry has been very successful in applying these to make air travel now extremely safe. hundred years ago, it was actually pretty risky. And you keep reading, oh, this famous actor died in the airplane crash here and there. So hundred years ago, it was actually not that safe to take airplanes. And by now, with applying these very effective ways of reducing downtime and component failure with redundancy and testing and checklists and so on, technical failure and human failure have been reduced to 
the minimum that makes it now a really safe industry. That level of systems thinking is super, super important. So you have this design ready and started building the product. Were there any big surprises after being very careful? Once you start building it, you still stumble on things. Were there big surprises? What was the biggest one that you had to surpass? The biggest surprise was that it's that reliable. We had expected a couple of interventions during our first deployment. We have not touched the system since September last year. I always show the video of the system on the surface. And then sometimes I have to remind myself, yeah, this is really the last time it was touching air. And since then, we've been submerged operating. We had a couple of software updates and some learnings there on the robustness. We had anticipated and planned a couple of physical interventions where we go out and check something, or we might have to even take it out of the water and do some inspection and other things. But based on the level of sensors we have, we have cameras on board, but also all other moving parts we're able to really measure remotely and just the cost of sensors and the way we can monitor all different steps in the conversion process of motion to power. We were down in San Diego for a month. And since then, we've been up here back in the Bay Area and just keeping an eye on our control panel and reading what's happening with the different subsystems and sometimes taking a look at the video. We must admit the diving team from UC San Diego, we're collaborating with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. They've really impressed us with the level of comfort they had in actually going and doing some video inspection on the device outside. And that just helped us to have also confidence in the moving parts and the unknowns that we might not see on our internal sensors. Wow. Congratulations. I don't hear such stories. Even Steve Jobs stumbles on the stage. But that just shows how much attention you guys pay to the detail and risk aversion of the team. That is phenomenal. There's so much to learn. I think we can just have a talk just on that subject at a different time. Maybe you can talk about ongoing projects. You talked about something going on in San Diego. And before you jump into that, are there optimal locations in the sea that are ideal for your equipment to be placed at? How do you determine that? There is a report from the Department of Energy that assesses the total marine energy available for the U.S. And the majority of that is actually wave power because the U.S. has a lot of coastlines, west and east coast. Really the best locations for wave power are the large oceans. So all along the Pacific, that's a really large ocean. Ocean waves are fundamentally generated by friction of wind over the ocean surface, and they can travel for very long distances without any losses. For example, the tsunami in Japan, a wave traveled all the way to Chile without any losses. The bigger the ocean, general rule of thumb, the bigger the wave resource. All along the U.S. coastlines, there's a lot of power available, the same in Europe. Some of the smaller oceans are not as suitable as, say, the Red Sea or the Baltic Sea. There is some wave energy there, but it's not as energetic as an Atlantic coastline or a Pacific coastline. In terms of projects, we just got awarded an additional larger DOE award in January, and that allows us to build and operate the X100, the larger second unit. And that is now planned to be installed in Oregon. And they have a new test facility specifically for wave energy that is fully pre-permitted and cabled. And that allows a lot of planning security on our end and will also greatly facilitate bank finance, the next systems in the future, and really roll them out similar to what we're seeing in offshore wind today with about 30 gigawatts of offshore wind in the pipeline in the US. So PuckWave is really a critical piece of infrastructure now that has that pre-cabled and grid-connected and site. And so we're one of the companies selected to deploy there and start exporting power to the grid. Maybe that's a good segue to talk about how you survived all these years, about the funding aspect of it. Maybe take a step back. When you started to launch the startup company, what were you thinking in terms of how you're going to raise money? And I see that you've won a lot of prizes and competitions. Maybe you can touch upon those things. Is that the path you envision? Or you thought because we are in the valley, it'll be easier to raise some VC money and it'll be a piece of cake. Talk about the psychology. So certainly we've been pretty opportunistic in these bootstrapped ways of finance the system. In the beginning, we knew that finding funding for clean energy or for new generation technology and hardware is pretty difficult in general, especially for private sector funding. So we got 
lucky or we've been also really active in finding alternative ways of financing. So if you just go to textbook seed funding for startups, you have your angels, you have your VCs, but that sometimes comes in later. You have your government grants, your SBIRs, and then you have bootstrapping actually as one of the ways of financing. So we've been pretty lean. We've used a lot of open source tools. We've found a lot of ways to reduce costs. So I think as a startup, you can ask yourself, okay, you raise all that money. And then what are you going to do with that money? And are there ways to find that cheaper or for free? So we've actually were able to leverage a lot of free resources, especially on the software side. We were supported by the Autodesk Foundation through their software packages, ANSYS, SolidWorks. They all have free software packages. And then we've also ran our own crowdfunding campaign in the very beginning on experiment.com where people just donated to build the first proof of concept in the lab. The very first cash we got from Berkeley Energy and Resource Collaborative from the Innovation Prize, and then the crowdfunding, I think it was 12K, and that allowed us to build a better tank unit. And then the US Wave Energy Prize was a unique animal that we really won cash price at the end. So we got a half million cash in the bank, pretty much profit, equity free that we could use for cost share. So these large DOE awards, they always come with a cost share aspect. So if we have a million dollar project, then for example, DOE funds 800K and then 200 have to come from us. And that can be at times software or in kind, but also cash. And so the Wave Energy Prize really gave us a great cash start. Then we were able to invest ourselves into the DOE project. Did you interact with the angels and VCs at all? Once we secured a large DOE award in 17, and that was about a 6 million award to build the first ocean going unit, we've then started raising a more traditional seed round. We've used a safe note there. So the very first investor was Breakout Labs out of the Teal Foundation. They came in really early and had to trust into our system and ability. And then we also got additional investments from the High Tide Foundation. 1517 was the latest last year. And then also we were part of Sustainable Ocean Alliance, which also participated in our seed round. We have a couple of undisclosed angels that we got introduced through our network and advisors. Do you wish there was anything different in the funding landscape to help startups like yours? Certainly since COVID, we've seen a lot of more capital going into climate tech because people started to realize how connected we are and that we're all just sitting on one single planet and not our individual bubbles. So climate change will affect everyone. And we see that with migration of displaced communities. You cannot escape from that nowhere, even in the areas that might not directly get affected through climate change but that the rippling effects of food crisis, migration crisis, civil wars, and so on. So these are things that will affect everyone. And I think COVID really was a wake-up call that there is no escape, essentially, not even in your bunker in New Zealand, where a lot of the peppers prepare for the doomsday. So I think we're seeing significantly more capital going into that space, which is exciting and also really critical now. And I think we have to move as quickly as we can the new report from the IPCC just came out and it just doesn't look good. We're more and more concerned that we're running out of time. So capital is certainly a critical piece to enable new technologies that we need to transition as quickly as we can. I hope and I wish this lot more capital to support startups like yours. On a different subject, in the prep for this call, something interesting came up when we talked about things that don't get discussed too much. You mentioned comparing early stage ocean tech to established technologies like solar and how that is not helpful. Can you shed some light into that and how investors or technology evaluators should look at new technologies? That's what we're seeing often. And there's a lot of debate in the public space that people start to compare X to Y and this is good and this is bad and so on. It looks like at the moment we need all of the above as quickly as we can. Of course, we acknowledge there is just so much funding, and so you have to make decisions on what technologies to advance with limited resources. We present our technology, and then the first question we get, oh, yeah, solar is so cheap now, and then say, hey, why do we need other technology? And that's very short-sighted from our point of view. Solar is so cheap because we're producing it in a high volume, and say, how can you ever become as cheap as solar? 
if you produce any product at the same volume than solar, then why shouldn't we be as cheap or same with offshore wind? You know, if you say, yeah, offshore wind is cheap now, we have large turbines, but then fundamentally just looking at it, it's steel and it uses a renewable resource and then uses generators to produce power. So why should a new technology at the same production level not become as cheap as others? I think that short-sighted view of also comparing technologies at different stages in different production volumes, I think that's sometimes a little frustrating. And what we're seeing that with curtailments and other issues, we need more renewables on all fronts and using all sources and not just one single solution that will solve everything. Maybe you can paint a picture of how long it took for solar to come to where this is right now, what the cost of production was initially and now. So just put things in perspective for the audience. Going back to my systems engineering time, the first solar was developed in the 70s for space applications to get power for satellites. I once saw one of the very early models that's still out in the museum. And then my PhD was funded by Rainer Le Mans Foundation in Berlin that was really one of the first. And still they developed Q-cells. And back in the 70s and 80s, people called him crazy to use semiconductors to produce electricity. And then as people realized we need renewables, then there were incentives and really a couple of taxpayer regions really took a leap there with California, Germany, Japan, initially putting out quite some incentives for solar. And then others were just watching that. And as the demand grew, that initial demand then people started building factories, and now we have really industrialized production that brought the cost down to where it is today, where at times the PPAs for solar are cheaper than any other source of power. That's just different phases of technological adoption and cost reduction there. If you have to provide a compare and contrast wave energy to solar and wind energies and the benefits, talk about that. What we're seeing from the IPCC is that due to the energy density of wave power, it is predicted to have the potential to become the lowest source of electricity, so the lowest life cycle emissions. So electron kilowatt hour produced per gram CO2 emissions to produce that system. So wind is already pretty good. Hydro is debated if it's regarded as renewable due to the big hydro the environmental impact on flooding valleys and dams and so on. So here compared to solar, for example, ocean energy has five times lower life cycle emissions. So there's a great opportunity there in the long run for really going based on pure emissions and energy intensity to build a new power plant. And I believe majority of the world lives closer to the coast more than inland. I'm assuming that transmission is going to be cheaper as well. Yeah, in the U.S., we have 50% of the population lives within 50 miles of the coastline. It's always the rule of thumb. And then we're seeing if we would want to go 100% renewable, as you pointed out, we would need transmission lines from the center of the country all the way to the coastlines versus for offshore wind. And that's the same argument why now offshore wind is marching forward is that right off the coast where the land might not be used as much as right on the coastline. And the distance of actual transmission lines is significantly shorter than long overland transmission. Wow, 50% of the population lives within 50 miles in the US. I'm assuming it should be the same around the world as well. Speaking of other sources of energy, are there lessons that you learned or mistakes that you avoided from what the others did? Certainly from the wave energy space to not jump to the megawatt unit right away but iterate with numerical models, with economic analysis before actually building it. And it's sometimes really hard to forecast cost for a large unit without actually building it. And then it's hard to get quotes from suppliers and say, hey, you're not buying 50 of this component tomorrow, then we're not going to give you a quote. So that's been a little bit of the challenge, certainly there. But I think we've benefited on not making that mistake of building really large systems and then not being able to incorporate lessons and changes. There are a lot of nuances in terms of building the team, developing the culture we've developed as CalWave, and then also who to collaborate with at what stages of development. So that was really the core challenge and expertise we've developed to select the right partners, the right engineering firms at the different stages. 
also funding partners with the DOE and enabling us to find these collaborations and also continued collaboration with UC Berkeley and the national labs. Now with Scripps Institution of Oceanography that allowed us to deploy our unit there. In general, I guess one lesson learned is that often new technology developers get very easily scared talking to outside people and collaborating because they're worried that their idea is going to get stolen and so on. And it's so hard and complex to develop a new system. Of course, you want to maintain some level of IP, if that is patents or trade secrets. But for us, what really has paid off the collaborative nature, and I think that's coming out of a university aspect where there is a lot of collaboration, publications, and so on. We carry that DNA forward, and we've been extremely collaborative with that industry and the national labs, as said, and others. Also, we've participated in a couple of global joint industry projects where we specifically investigated one subsystem together to share knowledge on that while still everyone being able to preserve their IP and move forward independently. Speaking of competition, are there others in the space that are doing similar work and how are you better than them? The Wave Energy Prize had 92 different Wave teams applying and we really were able to stand out by best performance. And at the end of the competition, we tested a 1 to 20 scale unit and got the highest performing results with a third party performance assessment. From our point of view, next to that high performance, it's really critical to be able to shut down the system, so reduce the loads in storm conditions. So we've really developed that unique capability of essentially becoming invisible to storms by being submerged. And we have three redundant mechanisms, pitch and yaw control, that operate independent from each other to reduce wave loads on the structure, on the load-bearing parts, the mooring, and so on. I want to definitely touch upon your personal experiences that have helped you launch the startup. It can be your educational background, work experiences, life experiences, or anything else. Did you always have a startup in mind? I grew up in Munich in Germany, and I think that area is not too encouraging for young people to try out new things. I worked at Siemens in the past in Eon, where the entire organization is more like a pyramid and very hierarchical and very degree-driven. They always call it the invisible ceiling, where if you don't have a PhD, you don't advance above a certain or the seniority complex, where just because someone is older, everyone else essentially has to listen, even if they have better answers to some questions. And that's what I really appreciate about the Bay Area in general, is that the general attitude is really more towards finding the best solution, very merit-based and very accessible and not constrained by certain titles. Overall, having that culture and atmosphere really fosters innovation. And personally, we developed CalWave as an independent entity was just the best mechanism to further advance the technology, being just independent, but still being able to collaborate with Berkeley in arm's length, develop our own IP. There are other ways to do that. There's entrepreneurship where you can develop a new product solution within a large corporation. I always like that quote. Every major accomplishment has been done by a small dedicated team, something along these lines. And that team can be in a research organization, in an academic constellation, or in a startup, or in a larger corporation. But I think finding that team that works well together and is complementary, that is really important to have these. Because it's really hard to have a single person, just from a personality perspective and background perspective, to cover all these aspects that are critical. But then on the other hand, they found research, any team larger than seven or eight people, just the communication and complexity drops and you have to have departments and so on. So I think there's that sweet spot of really having a fast and well-rounded team that can execute. Talking of teams, how big is your team right now? We are seven full-time at the moment. The right number. (laughs) And how do you scale a company like yours? Paint a picture of how the future might look like with your product lines. If everything goes your way. At the moment, we're planning to offer the X node later this year through some private financing that allows us to commercialize and scale the unit. And then the X100, we're planning to demonstrate at PuckWave, operate there, and then offer to the market right after in the next couple of years. From that, we can then upscale the 800 and really follow the same approach of demonstrating it at PuckWave and exporting power there and get certification. So for us, 
really the next big milestone is to get these units technically certified that we can access bank financing and that really allow the rapid adoption and scaling. The IDs were then bankable, the technology was reliable enough, the big pension funds and other asset classes then were able to put money into these 20 year, 30 year timeframe projects. Before we go to my traditional closing questions, do you have any plugins on behalf of Calway, jobs or fundraising or whatever? We do have an active conversation with investors. So now is a really good time to get in touch with us. And we have several open positions, a senior mechanical engineering position, electrical engineering, and also planning to offer more. So overall, we're planning to grow the team in the coming years with engineering, but then also commercial roles, VP of business development and chief of staff and a couple of others that should come online soon. So Please take a look at our homepage, calwave.energy. We have a newsletter there and we'll also announce new positions that come out as well as the current open positions can be found there. We will have a link in the show notes for these things. And now my traditional closing questions to everybody. What are a couple of not so obvious lessons you learned from building Calwave that others might benefit from or any mistakes that you would like others to avoid? Maybe I'll share some that's unique to our space. Silicon Valley always has that attitude, fail fast and learn fast. But that is only possible if your hardware is cheap enough. And there are hardware applications where it's possible. In our space, you can iterate quickly, but not by building things, but just doing the right engineering and being as lean and as quick as you can there in iterations. I think that it's often to not take these rules and say this is the only way and this is applies for everything, but being selective on what tools to be used at what stages and for what product and solution. And that comes from also acknowledging all the work that has been done before. The tools we have at our disposal have been built by others in the past. So that's really important to know what's the state of the art and what tools can you leverage and apply. A lot of people say with machine learning now that will unlock a lot of things or there are always these times in history where complementary things come together and then suddenly that enables a completely new product or industry where someone would have might not say, hey, we need it specifically this coding to then enable that new type of technology or refrigerators, for example. And so I think that's important really to keep learning and be aware of the state of the art and tools that can help you to advance the product. Are there one or two people that played a significant role in your startup journey that you'd like to acknowledge? Certainly all the mentors and supporters we had, as mentioned, one of the biggest critical phases for us was really with Cyclotune Road and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, that they really took quite a risk and put the first funding. We were in the very first cohort of Cyclotune Road. So them as a national lab being able to take that level of risk was really unique. And then, of course, the team there that mentored us over the years and helped us. And then, of course, the Department of Energy specifically here, the team we're working with at the Water Power Technology Office, securing that funding from Congress and then really identifying what areas of industry and development is most critical at the moment, and then enabling things like the Wave Energy Prize and then these demonstrations that have been critical for us. So without the Department of Energy, certainly it would have been impossible. Nowhere in the world we would have been able to find that level of funding for that technology at that stage. So I think them taking that risk and also allowing that. People always say the biggest angel investor in the world might actually be the SBIR program in the US. If you sum up the entire volume of investments they're doing from phase one to phase two and so on, they fund very early things and just say, hey, go and try it. And then Google comes out of it at times. So I think that's also acknowledging that investment is really critical and pays off over time. Indeed, indeed. SPRs are the biggest angel investors, actually. Well, Marcus, thank you so much. It has been fun reconnecting after a long time and learning about your impressive journey, building Calwave Energy. Good luck with all your endeavors. And we need deep tech founders like you to make this world a better place. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us and giving the opportunity to share a little bit of our story and hope to see you soon in person again as well. Absolutely. Pretty soon. Thank you so much. Bye, Ash. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com.